Okay. I'm opening the, I'm up, uh, admitting everybody. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Alfred. Welcome everyone. We will wait a minute uh, before the official in introductions for other peoples to join. Um, welcome otherwise, everyone. Hope you have a good day, evening or morning, wherever you are. Okay, uh, let me start the introductions. So welcome to this uh, edition of uh, the Virtual Seminars in Economic Theory. Uh, good to see you all. Today we have Jakob Pleschno from Chicago Booth presenting uh, the paper called Price Discovery in Waiting Lists. Actually, there's a new take, uh, subtitle, A Connection to Stochastic Gradient Des the Descent. This is joint work with Itai Ashlagi, uh, Peng Yu Chan, and Amin Saberi. Uh, we also have with us today a guest panelist, Francis Block. So uh, um, welcome everyone. Uh, the rules of engagements are: we have one hour uh, for the for the seminar itself. You can ask questions in the chat. You can ask uh, unmute yourself and ask questions live as well. But there is going to be an extra fifteen minute uh, Q and A sessions after we hit the uh, top of the hour. And of course, after that. Um, Feel free to stay for, for a minute or two or, or, or a few more minutes to just chat informally if you have time. Next week, just to remind you, we have Ellen Muir uh, talking about wage dispersion in voluntary unemployment and minimum wage wages under monopsony and oligopsony. All right, thank you very much. And um, uh, Jakob, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, I, I just got to saw how much of an operation it is to set it up. So like, I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> um, so two things uh, before I start. One is we dropped the last part of the title to make it seem less scary. Hopefully you'll hear because you think it's interesting. Um, we'll show you prices in waiting lists, price discovery, and I'll tell you something about the stochastic writing descent uh, and hopefully uh, you all come out satisfied. And second thing is like I should, uh, sorry. Oh, um, second thing I should uh, acknowledge my co-authors, my great co-authors, Itai Schlagi and Amin Saberi are from Stanford. Peng Yuxian is the driving force from this. Uh, you'll see the technical contribution. That's all credit goes to him. If you have any difficult questions, I'll refer it to him. Huh? Okay, so, Price discovery in waiting list. First thing, um, I want to give you the motivation for this talk, which is twofold. First, waiting lists are often used. Like the most uh, prominent example that I'll use throughout is public housing. A lot of public housing is allocated to waiting list mechanisms where you come to some uh, agency that allocates housing, you put your name on the list. And it's not like a normal queue, you just like have your name on the list, but when you come to choose, you'll be offered a choice between uh, an apartment, like say in your York Public Housing Authority, uh, you come and choose and you choose between a project in Brooklyn and a project in the Bronx. One of them may be more popular than the other. So you may have six month waiting time if you wanna get the project in Bronx, but two years if you wanna be in Brooklyn. Um, want to understand how those mechanisms commonly work and part of the motivation of this paper is to understand that. But the other motivation is that you can think of those mechanisms as mechanisms that do price discovery. So first of all, um, we're going to think about prices in waiting lists. So when I say you have six month wait for an apartment in the Bronx versus two years uh, for an apartment in Brooklyn, that means that waiting time clears the market in a very similar way to prices. Agents who come and make their choices choose between different waiting times. And we're gonna think about waiting cost, the waiting cost that the agents face as a price, as a, as a price. The model will make it uh, super clear and the model will look uh, basically identical to competitive equilibrium model, except that instead of paying with money, you're paying with waiting cost. Now, there's, of course, a lot of important differences between paying with money and paying with waiting times. But the one that we want to focus on in this paper is the price discovery. Okay. Um, 
the waiting list mechanism, the New York Public Housing Authority does not decide that uh, Brooklyn is going to be a six month wait and Bronx will be two years. They just have a process in which the waiting time is endogenously determined. Why is the waiting time for Brooklyn two years? Because more people came and joined the waiting list. So there's more people on the project, on the waiting list, on the queue for the Brooklyn project. Therefore, the waiting cost for that is longer. There's an endogenous price formation here that discovers the prices, that determines the prices. And I think that's a very interesting setting where we actually can formally describe exactly how prices are formed. I don't know how Amazon dictates its prices or determines its prices, but they know exactly how the prices are determined in the waiting list, which makes it like um, what a fruit fly for price discovery. You know? So I think of this as being interesting as a, some sort of setting where we can really study price discovery by a very simple process also. And the process is very natural. If a person joins the, the queue for Brooklyn, there's one more person on the queue for Brooklyn. The waiting time for Brooklyn goes up by one notch, one more person. That seems very similar to Tanama. Like if you demand something, the price of that thing goes up. So it actually does not seem like a crazy price discovery process either. And I'll show you that it's not. It's going to have its own inefficiencies, but it's not a crazy price discovery. And we want to investigate exactly how good or bad it is. So before I get into the model, I think it's really helpful to just do uh, an illustrative example. So let's think of the simplest example that I could conjure. Um, Can I stop you, Jacob? I'm supposed to yeah? stop you and ask you questions. Um, yeah, of course. OK, so one, um, I have a question about the meaning of price discovery that you have in mind here. So in the second part of the paper, basically, you're assuming that you don't know the values. Mm -hmm. um, is that? what you have in mind when you think about price discovery, you think that there is something that the planner does not see and that the price is going to reveal? Yeah, I think of um, one of the really nice things, really nice properties of this thing is that the New Public Housing Authority does not necessarily know whether the Brooklyn uh, project is better than Brox or vice versa, and this mechanism figures that out by itself. And moreover, if there are changes, if something happened in Brooklyn and suddenly the Brooklyn project is not as good as it was five years ago, it will also adjust automatically. So I see that as a big benefit of this. And, um, and just the fact that I know exactly how prices are determined is just a nice thing that I can study how prices are formed, right? We usually think of an invisible hand, but like here we, we see the invisible hand working. Can I ask uh, also a question here? So when you say price, when we say prices, it, it 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 is a transfer. So it's 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 something that uh, a buyer pays, but a seller receives. So it, there is no social loss associated with this. But yeah. obviously, in your case, it's not like that because it's a waste. So is that not too much to say it's a price? So a uh, great question. It's a first order thing about the setting, which we're gonna uh, not address to, to be full transparent. We're not gonna address this. Uh, what we're gonna maximize in the model, what we're gonna find that this will maximize is allocative efficiency, yeah? which is not prices, uh, not utilities net of prices, but just like the value of assigned items. Um, in some settings, it's really important that you don't think just of allocative efficiency, but welfare, because waiting time is getting uh, getting uh, getting wasted. In our model, uh, this will be true as well, but it's not going to be as uh, as problematic for two reasons. Um, first, if you think of the New York public housing, the cost of waiting is just the cost of me not being in an apartment. It's not the waiting per se. It's not that I do something extra to be on the waiting list. It's just that I don't get an apartment. As long as all the apartments are assigned, you basically reduce the waiting cost by as much as you can. The cost is that I pay market rent until I get an apartment. As long as we house as many people in apartments and keep all the apartments full, we did all that we can do to reduce waiting costs. And whether I to choose to wait two years and you choose to wait six months or vice versa, that's just a transfer. In particular, whether I choose Brooklyn or, or the Bronx, that's a transfer. 
So that's like that's uh, that's at least one dimension that we're gonna be really focused on. That's gonna be much closer to transfers. And in our model, it's I'm actually not gonna state this result today, but it is gonna be true that all items are gonna be assigned. We have this result in the paper. Yeah, the actually the example that I have is particularly bad in this regard, so it doesn't show this and really makes this problem striking. Um, but in the real model where we think about trade-offs between different items, we have a result showing that items are, are uh, wasted with a tiny probability. Yeah? So that's uh, so to that. Um, but I think that's a really uh, good kind of like uh, question, and we study a particular mechanism and. Other people should follow up and kind of think about whether like we should maybe do other things to reduce the waste from uh, overall waiting. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, let me go to the example. So this is the simplest example and it's actually gonna be uh, really bad in the sense that you just mentioned that uh, waiting cost is gonna be wasteful here, but uh, um, it's good to kind of like, it's the simplest example to illustrate kind of what's going on. And I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll be clear in a second why we need this kind of example, okay? So think of a single item that arrives at Poisson rate one. Items arrive at Poisson rate two, so twice as often as items. When an agent arrives, they observe the queue length. There's a single queue to the item, they can easily join the queue or leave. And they have a quasi-linear utility. So they have value minus some coefficient times uh, waiting time. So just translating from waiting time, uh, from time units to utility units. Um, and this utility says uh, that, uh, uh, that if my value is one, I'm willing to wait for 50 arrivals of the item. Uh, if my utility is half, I'm willing to wait for 25 arrivals of the item. Huh? Um, and now we ask what would be the benchmark for allocating things. So let's ignore the waiting cost. Let's assume the waiting cost is a price and just optimize allocative efficiency. If I ever say welfare in the talk, it's my mistake. I always should say allocative efficiency. Um, so let's think of uh, imaginary benchmark. We ignore all the problems with the dynamic problem. We just wait until some long time P and then we have the distribution of agents, the quantity of items that arrive, and then we just do a static assignment. What will be the, what, the allocative efficiency maximizing uh, assignment at this point? Well, we can assign half the agents. Let's assign the half that have the highest value. And we can easily do that if we just post a price, monetary price of a half. Yeah? So now, Given that we know the static benchmark, let's go back to the dynamic problem and ask, well, are we gonna get something close to this dynamic, uh, to this uh, static benchmark in the dynamic problem? Well, that depends on what price people see. If all the agents come and see a waiting cost equal to a half, they'll make exactly the same decision as in the static benchmark, right? So the dynamics per se is not problematic. The what could be problematic in the dynamic is that agents come, and when you come, you're not necessarily gonna see a price of a half, you may see some other prices. Yeah? What price will you see? Well, that depends how many agents are on the queue when you arrive. If we run the system for a long time, we're gonna get some distribution. Yeah? So first of all, we're not gonna get convergence here because the system has this inherent randomness. But we can think of running the system into a long, over a long time and see what prices we get out of it. So if we run the system for a long time and look at the empirical distribution, that's what we get. And you can see that prices are somewhat around the market clearing price. Yeah, so the market clearing price is generated by 24 people in the queue, because if you see 24 people are ahead of you, you have to wait for 25 of them to get assigned plus yourself, so 25 arrivals of the item or waiting cost equal to a half. And you can see that most of the time, most of the agents will arrive and see some waiting cost that's in this area. Okay, can you see my uh, cursor? Yeah, yeah. So most of the time, the, the static benchmark is the right benchmark, 
we get something pretty close to that, but not exactly that. Yeah? And the fact that we get some probability of getting very low prices means that there's some probability that an agent who has a value of 0.4 will come and actually join the queue because the queue just happened to have an abnormally low price when they arrived. Yeah. But that cost, like that's that's an inefficiency because like, you know, that needs to balance. Only half the agents can get assigned. That needs to balance with some agents that has a value of 0.6 and doesn't come because it doesn't get assigned because the value, the, the waiting cost is when he arrives is way too big. If I plot this can in I terms you, of, yeah? Can I ask you, so basically these are probabilities in steady state. So basically what you're looking at is a Markov process with this number of people in the queue. Yeah. Um, and can you tell us a little more on the Markov process or will you tell us a little more? I mean, how? Um... It's uh, the Markov process that you get by just running the system and each agent just decide whether to join or not given their own value. Yeah? Okay. And given that it's a first come first serve queue, it's a very easy decision. You see how many people are in the queue, you decide to join or not join. You don't need to know anything else. You see everything you need to know. Okay. Yeah? Uh, the distribution may be a bit complicated, but like the agent's decision is very simple. And we get something that I would call endogenous price formation or price discovery. That's gonna give us something close to the market claim prices, but not quite. It's gonna be some, uh, some noise around this. And if I translate this noise to the allocation, you can see that uh, an agent that has a value of 0.4 has about 10% chance, sorry, 20% chance, slightly less than 18% chance uh, to actually get the item. And an agent with a value of 0.6 has about 20% chance not to get the item. So we get that this process and don't just find something close to market clearing, but not quite. We have some inefficiency from, from that. Huh? And now, what we want to study is this process for a much more general economy, for the more interesting examples where we actually have a Brooklyn and a Bronx and many, many projects in each and a general distribution of values. And we want to ask when we try to run this waiting list mechanism, is this mechanism going to discover the right waiting time for Brooklyn versus Bronx and send people to the right place? Or are we going to have people who are sent to the wrong project? and we're gonna have a lot of misallocations. Yeah. So what is the allocated efficiency loss under this fluctuating price and dodgingly discovered prices uh, for general economy? And to kind of like uh, preface our results, we're gonna give you um, uh, a bound showing that this price discovery will find the market claim prices up to having a loss that's uh, bounded by the adjustment size. The adjustment size, somebody is drawing on my slides. Yeah. Uh, the adjustment size is gonna, be, um, is gonna be, what is the impact, the change in price of one agent joining the queue? So I joined the queue for the Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn project. Did the waiting time go from two years to three years or from two years to two years in a week, yeah? That impact, does the waiting time change by a lot when somebody joins or by little will be the important statistic to look at. I'm gonna show you a couple of more results showing that like the bound is tight and when the loss is negligible to give us a bit more understanding about what is actually going on here and how should I understand the efficiency of this price discovery process and where does the loss come from. And the biggest intuition will come from a connection to the Sukhazi Granny descent algorithm. That's an optimization algorithm. I'll explain it in more detail when we get to this a bit later. Okay. Um, the price adaptation here, the price discovery can be thought exactly as a weird run of the Sukhazi Granny descent algorithm. And given that we know that, we can use a bunch of tools that are used in the literature that analyze those kind of algorithms to get those results in bound that they told you about. Yeah. And if I have time in the end, I can tell you about how we can use this model also to generate some sort of price rigidity. Um, we're, we're not macroeconomists. I'm not a macroeconomist. Maybe somebody who's listening is. Um, macroeconomists think a lot about price rigidity. 
the pricing heuristic that we have here can very naturally generate some, some form of price rigidity. So um, I'll talk about this in the end if I have time. Yeah. yeah. So um, there's a bunch of related work that I should be mentioning here. Here's like a really kind of like a small sample of papers. So first, there's a lot of papers on dynamic matching mechanisms. And one thing that we do differently from a lot of them is we have a setting where it's impossible, or at least as far as we know, it's impossible or not tractable to calculate the stationary distribution. Yeah? So the, the example that I gave you was one, one dimensional and it was pretty critical for us to be able to just show you the distribution of prices. I could of course empirically calculate it for any distribution, but once you go to a multi-dimensional case, things become very intractable. And a lot of the papers that study queuing problems limit attention to uh, two items or, or a restriction that makes the Markov chain one dimensional. Yeah? We do not need this restriction because we use a different technique and we don't actually need to calculate the Markov, uh, Markov chain uh, stationary distribution. Yeah? The other thing is like, of course we are, uh, we're doing something that's very closely related to just calculating prices, or we're going to talk about gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent. There's a lot of work on using those kind of algorithms to discover prices. Our setting is different from all of those because uh, this never converges. A lot of the use of those algorithms starts from time zero. You don't know the prices until at some point you calculate prices and you're done. We have a system that keeps on going forever and continues to fluctuate forever. Yeah, so it's going to be somewhat different from those settings too. Yeah? And partly the noise or the losses will come here is because the waiting list does not know, oh, we discovered the right prices. Like there's no moment where the waiting list would say, I can stop fluctuating and updating. Yeah? Uh, and that would be much clearer once I get to the results. That was the results and the analogy with discussing writing in the center. Yeah. Okay. So with that said, uh, happy to take questions at any time. There are no questions, let me just jump into the model. Okay, great. Um, so we tried to make the plain vanilla model uh, to study this question. So items arrive according to a Poisson process. Total rate of items is normalized to one. Those are finitely uh, many kinds of items. Uh, the null set denotes a null item. So the Q does not explode, that's... Uh, that's not the, uh, an assumption we would be happy to dispense with, but um, that's the standard way that you uh, prevent queuing system from exploding. We need something like that. Okay? With probability mu j, an arriving item is of type j. You can think of mu j as a supply of item j. Okay? Agents arrive according to a Poisson process with total rate lambda. Given that we normalize the rate of agent of items to one, you can think of lambda as the rate of agents per items. Yeah? We're generally gonna think of lambda bigger than one, but not necessarily. Yeah? Um, um, when an agent arrives, you draw the type from some distribution. Think of any distribution. It can be a skewed distribution, continuous value distribution, whatever you, totally general and the types will have values for all the different items, arbitrary correlations, any, any, anything that you can do in compatible equilibrium, we'll do here. The one thing we do is we assume that agents have unit demand that makes uh, prices exist and the uh, price discovery much easier. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, agents have quasi-linear utility. An agent of type theta has utility U theta JW given getting an item of type J and waiting time W. And we have quasi-linearity in waiting time or uh, separability in the waiting time. Uh, we can do nonlinear waiting cost. Doesn't really matter for the intuition or anything because that just needs to be a price. And for most of our results, we're just gonna take it to be linear because it simplifies things. Uh, the more important thing is, oh, sorry, that values of items are arbitrarily correlated. Yeah? Um, the value of just living immediately normalized to zero, values of private information as normal uh, as in any competitive equilibrium market, and values are bounded, uh, makes our lives, uh, simplifies the models a bit. Yeah? And the waiting cost is just smooth. Like, you know, think of it as linear, it doesn't matter. Yeah. 
Jacob, can I take yes. you back to the two motivating examples? So uh, the organ yeah. transplant and the house and the yeah. social housing. So, um, so some comments actually on the assumptions that you're making here. For social housing, uh, how likely is it that actually types are ID as opposed to um, for the same object? I mean, do we think that actually the values may be correlated? And but that the value can be correlated across items. Uh, across agents, I was thinking. So I'm thinking of uh, in, so I some think apartments of, like, are on the top like, floor. Some apartments are on the top floor. So it's like I have V theta J. So it's possible for all different thetas, all agents prefer item seven. Okay. That's allowed. Okay. okay. It's just that I have a population of agents. They think of the static assignment problem. I took whatever I do in the static competitive equilibrium and I just sampled now the agents arrive one by one. Okay. I, I literally, like you can, you can think of this as like, I took the same market that you have in competitive equilibrium, except that the agents arrive one by one, except all to, instead of all together. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Second, I think for the organ transplant, I'm a little more puzzled because here, um, I mean, I know very little, but I was thinking that actually here, uh, the idea that of the quality of the object that you get probably depends on how long you've been waiting. So the separability here between the waiting costs and the value is not totally. I agree. To the, the, this is a much kind of like the fit for the model is much. Uh, um, the motivation is mostly the public housing example, where I think of the cost as you pay $400 of rent a month until you get to your apartment. And that's okay. kind of much more separable, uh, a separable cost. If you push me to use it, like I can say the cost of the analysis per month, but like, yeah, that's like full. It's not the, let's think of public housing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So an assignment just tells me which agent got which item. And I'm going to think of a discrete time process that exactly describe the pass on arrival. I can just think of arrivals. So in the pass on process, nothing happens unless an agent arrives and I can just index the arrivals one by one. So T will be arrival time, the first arrival, second arrival, that can be either an agent arriving or an item arriving. The script T tells me that an agent arrived in this epoch. And the kind of efficiency is just take all the agents that ever arrived, sum the, uh, and take the average value of the assigned items. And that's what this formula just says, just the average value of assigned items okay. uh, per agent. Okay. Um, the optimal allocative efficiency is that I take a realization of the world, and I look at what allocation would maximize the value of assigned items out of all possible allocations. Okay? And the expectation just takes all, just uh, is taken over all possible realizations of the world. Okay? So this expectation has got to be degenerate given that I have infinite time horizon, but like just think of this as average value of assigned items. Okay? Somebody wants to talk uh, to ask me about the non Ponzi condition. I'm happy to talk about it, but if nobody, I'll uh, just skip it. Let me just say that we we just have a restriction so that if you end the world at some finite time, you get something that approximates uh, the uh, the finite time well. Okay? So you don't cheat given the infinite horizon. Okay? That that's all that it does. Okay. okay. We're gonna study the waiting, waiting list mechanism, what we call the waiting list mechanism, which just has a separate queue for each item. Each queue has a first come first served. And agents who join the queue just wait in it until they're assigned. Yeah? So we thought of this as a pain vanilla. Um, two nice things about it. Um, one is uh, agents make a single decision. Okay? So, 
you'll see in a second that as an agent that comes to the system, your choice looks equivalent to a choice of agent in a normal competitive equilibrium, normal market. Okay? You just make one choice. There's no option value calculation or anything uh, complicated because you know exactly your waiting time in each, uh, your expected waiting time in each one of the queues. Okay? Um, and part of it, the second point is the first come for self says you don't care about people coming behind you. Uh, so I don't need to have beliefs about what happens after I join. No, like if I see the number of people in the queue, I know everything I need to know about my expected waiting time. So that's nice for a setting. Huh? Um, I should say somebody probably wants to ask a question, what if people want to switch queues? Huh? You only want to switch queues if there's news. If you learn something new in the future. Huh? If like you think in the asymptotic regimes where uh, you think of a high traffic, will have some asymptotic results. Uh, we have some asymptotic results in the paper. Like you shouldn't think that the queues fluctuate too much. You only want to switch queues if you think that's like those news and like, there's going to be fluctuations in the future that are unexpected. Yeah. We, those are kind of like uh, situations where you think that this mechanism will do particularly badly, like you'll see in a bit. Um, and we want to kind of avoid those higher moments. We don't want to think about them. We think that those second order stuff. So uh, for our consideration, it's going to be much cleaner to think about like a single choice. Yeah? A single choice that does not need to think of a higher moments. Yeah. Can I ask a clarifying question? Sometimes you say an item, sometimes you say a type of item. So uh, when when an um, agent arrives, do they choose in which queue to stand? Or yeah. are they assigned to a particular queue? And OK, so, when... let, so let's go to the agent choice. That's exactly the next thing I wanted to talk about. Huh? An agent arrives, they see uh, bold queue is just the number of agents on each one of the queues. Yeah. And now you choose which queue you want to join. There's one queue for each item, one, two, three, up to capital J. And you choose which one. If you choose QJ, you're going to eventually get item J and get your utility V theta J. Okay. But you're going to have to wait until you do so. And you're going to have the expected waiting time for item J given the current state of the queues. Huh? And you're going to choose whichever J maximizes this, potentially the null item, which is choosing nothing. Huh? Um, huh? So I should say this is a very, this is a simplified version of what happens in the New York Public Housing Authority. In the New York Public Housing Authority, what happens is that, that you sign up to the waiting list. There may be a couple of years where nothing happens, but eventually somebody will call you into a meeting and say, here are the waiting times for the different projects. At this point, you make your choice, choose which of the projects and you want, and here's some indication of the waiting times. Uh, probably two years from the Bronx, six months from Brooklyn, make your choice. Yeah? Of course, the, there's a lot of, um, details that like I'm ignoring in actual public housing, but at a high level, that's the, the choice that I, agents actually make. Yeah? Can I ask you if I yeah. complicate the model a little bit to get yeah. closer to reality? I don't know which parts are important, which parts are not important. So uh, for example, one complication could be that actually you may be bypassed by people who have priority, so who are behind you, but end up having priority, but I, that's not really important, right? That's just a compute. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't formally uh, show this, but I, I would say that just kills arrivals. That's just reduce the arrival rate of items to the queue. Yeah. What about the possibility that you join multiple queues? So I think that's not actually, uh, that's not, um, not what we model, but in some sense, it's gonna be equivalent. Because suppose you choose multiple queues, that just means that you delay your decision to later. Yeah. Right, that just, and again, if there's no news, if my expected waiting time 
or the difference in expected waiting time that I see now is going to be the same difference in expected waiting time that I'll see later when I, I'm forced to choose, no? then I might as well choose now. But doesn't that increase the dimensionality of the problem? Because I need to know all the queues everywhere in order to compute. I mean, I'm... Um... So the J's here are all the items I can eventually get assigned to. And I'm gonna choose in advance exactly the item I'm gonna get a choose that I'm gonna get assigned. Okay. If you think there's uh, I choose a project and then a department within the project or wing, let's say wing within the project, yeah, I would ask, wait, well, can't you just give me the waiting time estimate in advance for all the wings in a project, and I'll just choose those to begin with. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm simplifying for like uh, things that a lot of those things are interesting, but we're kind of focusing on, I think the price discovery and like whether you give first order uh, price expectations. And in some settings, like there is gonna be some stochasticity and use and option value calculations or some systems are built this way that, uh, but for the price discovery questions, we're uh, kind of intentionally um, simplifying on all those other dimensions to say, like, well, let's just look at the first moment, like just the price discovery and whether we get that right or, or not, and kind of like uh, abstracting away from all those other questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, one very nice thing about this setting is that you can literally write it as the choice in competitive equilibrium. Well, I took this uh, this expected waiting cost and I just wrote it as a price. Okay? So this expected waiting cost that because of the first come first served assumption depends only on the state of the particular queue. That, that doesn't really matter, but what noting uh, just on the queue, you know, just on that particular queue, just it can be thought of a price that's state dependent. So just like in the example. What will matter is what prices people see. Everybody comes, sees, uh, sees the queue in a certain state. Uh, it sees a vector of prices for the different item. The question is, what is this vector of prices? And is it gonna be close to the market clearing uh, vector of prices or is it gonna be something other, other than that or random? Huh? So one option is to just look at this as a stochastic process and calculate the stationary distribution. If I'm in some state, uh, QT, there's some chance that an agent comes, sees the length of all the Q, the prices, and decide to join QJ. And then the price of QJ goes up by one notch. I have this kind of transition. There's some chance that an item comes to QJ and then the price of item J goes down by one notch. And more, and generally I will just have a, uh, Markov process, Markovian process over this grid of prices. It doesn't necessarily to have be really a grid like the way I draw it, but I'm lazy, so I draw a grid. Yeah, but we have some station distribution of all those prices. Problem is that, like I said, in the setting that we're interested in with multiple items, we don't know how to calculate station distribution and we suspect that it's not tractable to do that. Like there are some papers in operations uh, by Gin and Weiss that conjecture that it's actually C sharp to C sharp how to calculate this. Yeah. Um, okay, so what do we do? Yeah. Our approach actually looks at a, a statistic called the adjustment size. The adjustment size is just the maximal uh, distance between two points in the grid. What is the maximal change in price from one arrival? So one agent joined a queue for item J, for some item J. What is the maximal price difference in utility units? Yeah. If apartments arrive once a year, that's big. You just increase the price of an apartment by a year. If apartments arrive daily, that's nothing. Yeah. If you have linear waiting costs, they can very easily write this as just the cost of one arrival. Yeah. This is C. Uh, uh, times one of OBU, so the cost of one arrival. So if C is $400 a month rent times a month, that's $400. If that's a year, that's almost $5,000. Okay? And I'll need some notation for the allocated efficiency of the waiting list. That's just going to be this WWF. 
And that's just the expected allocative efficiency of this waiting list mechanism where I just run the process where agents select the queues given the prices that they see. Okay, now finally I can give you the, uh, the main result. So we say the allocative efficiency of the waiting list is at least as large as the optimal allocative efficiency that anything can generate minus a loss that's bounded by some scalars times the adjustment size. So if lambda is equal to two, so twice as many agents as items arrive, this just cancels out and we have just one delta. Another version that I can give you of this is suppose that items are scarce, delta is strictly bigger than one, all the items are strictly over-demanded uh, and prices are strictly positive for any market clearing price. Yeah? In the background, this implies that items are never was wasted. Okay, that there's a result in the paper saying that in this case, I, uh, items will never or very seldom be, be wasted. Then the allocative efficiency under the waiting list is at least as big as the optimal allocative efficiency minus exactly the adjustment size. And this epsilon is going to be exponentially small. Um, let me not go, to, go into the exact definition, but just trust me that it's small. The details are in the paper. Yeah. So what does that mean? We took the public housing. We said, we're not gonna tell you what prices are. We're gonna just let prices adjust according to some tatanama. We know that that's gonna cause some fluctuations. Sometimes we're just gonna have three people join the Bronx apartment, join the queue for the Bronx because they really like the Bronx and the price for the Bronx will jump up. That will cause misallocation with some probability. But how much do we pay for the fact that we don't actually set the right prices? Well, the adjustment size. Yeah. You're guaranteed to have at least as high as allocative efficiency as if you did the optimal thing, minus everybody waiting for one more arrival in the case of linear waiting cost. So is this good I or bad? Ask you a question about um... yeah commensuration actually between those two because as you said i mean w wl and w out um are only about allocative efficiency and don't take into account the cost the yeah. waiting cost and delta depends on the cost yeah um, so how am i supposed to think um so i can view those as really two completely uh -huh. orthogonal measures um so how am i sure for example that w out is not very far from delta. I mean, very. Um, how? I mean, you you want me to you want me to think of delta as very small? No, I, delta is exogenous. Delta is whatever it is. Because if okay. apartments arrive once a year, okay. then delta is going to be high, and that's that's alarming for the public housing allocation system. That says like your prices could probably be very much out of the whack and expect a lot of misallocations. If delta is really small, then it means that I don't need to worry about this. But delta is whatever it is. Like I, the, the public housing authority has very little control of whether apartments arrive monthly, weekly, or biannually. Right, but in the objective, in, in knowing whether they should take into account welfare or just allocative efficiency, I'm slightly worried that the delta captures the cost, which is not in the Ws. That's all I'm saying. It, it, it's correct, but that's I'm saying even if you just think of the allocative efficiency and you think of this as a test saying like, should I be worried about misallocations and allocative efficiency loss? We're telling you, you should be worried if the delta is big. If the delta is small, you, should, you don't need to. No? No. So that's what we can say to the public housing authority about like the price discovery process. Um, so let me try to give you a bit of intuition. Why, why does delta affect the efficiency here? Like why high delta means that I'm gonna get bad allocative efficiency. Small delta means uh, good allocative efficiency. Yeah? So let's say that I have some item and the market can price is six months. Like the Bronx apartment should be six months of waiting time. If the Bronx apartment arrived monthly, then I generate this waiting cost of six months by having five plus one people on the waiting, on waiting list or the project for that. Well, if I have five people 
on the on the queue for the Bronx apartment and two leave. Now I'm at a drastically different price. If I have two extra joining, now at a price that's drastically different. Prices will fluctuate very dramatically from events that are very likely to happen. Yeah. So it's pretty clear that like I can have very bad mispricing and therefore very bad misallocations where uh, delta is really big and kind of like the price will fluctuate widely. Yeah. What is less clear is why does a small delta imply a small loss? Because yeah? if you think about it, like the immediate effect of people arriving uh, to the list or moving from the list is really small if the delta is small. Like let's say that apartments arrive daily, daily, daily so I need 180 people on the list, two leave, two join, doesn't make much of a difference, but they still don't understand why can't I have just like, two leave and then two more leave and then two more leave. And like, eventually I get a drift until I get to widely different prices. What kind of balancing back to the right prices if Delta is small. Yeah. To understand that, I need to take you on a bit of a detour. Yeah. So hold with me. I'm gonna make a bit of a detour to two other related problems and then we're gonna tie this all back in. Yeah. So the first detour is to the static problem. Yeah. And the argument I said in the toy example in the beginning actually holds more generally. If you just have the right prices throughout, if I could just make everybody see the market clearing prices, I could have the optimal allocative efficiency. So there's some technical details in showing this, but you know you don't need to read the, the equations here. It's just, if you write the static allocative efficiency, Turns out that this is exactly what you can get in the dynamic setting in exactly the same way as I told you in the toy example in the beginning, just get the right prices. If you show everybody market current prices, they'll choose the right items and you will get, get the maximum locative efficiency, okay? So I'm gonna use W star to think about the uh, offline optimal or the static optimal. And that's already gives me some simplification that's much easier to think about. Another thing that's very helpful about the static problem is that they can take dual of the static problem. And now we have a problem that takes in prices. So the dual of the static problem, um, the standard, like there's many ways to take this, but one way is to take this function. And now I have some function that takes in prices and gives me some indication of how far prices form market clearing prices. So did I change prices in a way that matters a lot or does not matter? This function can give me some indication of like did prices change in a bad direction or a lot or a little. Okay. okay. So I have this dual. Um, optimizing this dual, optimizing over prices, gives me exactly the same uh, optimal allocative efficiency as I get in the allocation problem because that's the duality. Okay. Yeah. So the second thing that I want to add in is stochastic writing in descent. Okay. So let's think about, to explain what it is, let me first go again and look at the stochastic process. So I know that I have some optimal prices. They don't necessarily have to be one of the grid points, but I just drew them as a grid point. Um, and I have a stochastic process where whenever I have some price, there's some chance that the price will increase or decrease in different directions. Um, there's some grid of prices, there's some adjustment size, and I have some stochastic process and the change in price is random. But it's helpful to look at the expected change in price. Let's look at the expected change in price. So what's the expectation when I take one arrival from T to T plus one? So one arrival, and I look at the expected change in the length of the queue. What is this change? Well, one arrival can either be an agent or an item. Yeah. If it's an agent, it affects QJ if the agent chose QJ. And if it's an item, it affects QJ if it's a supply for QJ. So what we get is that the expected change is exactly the demand for J given current prices minus supply for J. So it's exactly demand minus supply, which is exactly the tunnel model or a subgradient of the dual objective. 
So now there's two ways uh, to describe it. One is if I had the expected change every time, I would be doing exactly the tonoma. I'm not doing the tonoma because I'm taking one sample, one agent at a time, and only a, a one agent or item I draw, whether it's an agent or an item. And I'm going to do the random adjustment with one sample it's instead of like the actual distribution, except instead of the actual demand and supply, it just take one sample. Yeah? So it's going to be somewhat random version of this tonoma. The other version to say this is that it's exactly uh, stochastic gradient descent. The tonoma is basically gradient descent for the dual objective. It's saying, um, Take the function you're trying to optimize, calculate what is a subgrade, what direction will make things better, and move in this direction. The gradient descent is basically, um, sorry, let me say, gradient descent is the algorithm that says whatever function you're trying to minimize, just think of what is the subgrade, what is the direction in which the function goes down, and take a step down in that direction. Yeah? Stochastic gradient descent. It's just a random version of this. So to explain what it is, let me say one prominent use, like uh, deep learning. Like suppose you have a database of 4 million pictures and you're trying to see whether you can match whether which picture is a cat or not. It's pretty expensive to value the function, how well you do for all the 4 million pictures. But if I randomly select one picture and then I get something that's noisy, but in expectation is the true function. And people that do deep learning and a lot of learning algorithms learn that like you can do a stochastic update. Well, at each point I update based on the one sample, I get the noisy version of the gradient descent, a stochastic gradient descent, but that optimizes it well. Yeah? So if I do those algorithms, I will converge, I will go towards the objective. One thing is that when I use those algorithms for optimization, I start from some big step size to go quickly towards the optimal value. But as I get close to the optimal value, I need to decrease my step size. And when I'm really close to the optimal value, I need to stay very close. I need to take very small steps and kind of make sure that I'm still staying next to the optimal value. Yeah. What we have here is we go in the direction of the optimal value and subgradient, but the step size is exogenously given. We, we don't change it. We don't even set it to begin with. It's just whatever it is. And that explains now why we get a lot of loss if the step size is big, because we're eventually going to get close to the optimal value and then bounce around them. If the step size is small, then we're going to bounce in a smaller neighborhood, because we're going to bounce in a smaller neighborhood of the, of the optimal value. Yeah? So you're never converging. With... You never converge. So if you really wanted to implement it with an algorithm, how would you know when to stop or when to, what is the value of capital T that will? Uh, uh... So th that's a good question for like the computer scientists to use those algorithms. For us, so we can do this anyway. So like, <laughs> yeah. Um, our algorithm, our, our kind of waiting this is just a stupid version of this algorithm, which doesn't even know to converge. So how close will you get to converging? That's the step size. That's why the step size is so instrumental here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's the intuition. Yeah. Like you get that in expectation, you go in the right direction. Yeah. I, I can't write on my slides, uh, but like uh, think of like I'm here, I'm more likely to move towards the P star. So I'm, I'm not going to drift too far. But once I'm close here, like I'm just going to bounce around yeah? and have some loss because I'm bouncing around. And that kind of explains the picture that we started with. Like, let me kind of run back to this picture. You can think that I'm not very likely to drift very far away because if I'm really high, almost everybody will leave the queue. So like there's going to be a big push yeah, to decrease the queue size. If prices are way too low, a lot of people will join the queue. So there's going to be a big push to increase the queue size. Huh? But once I'm in the neighborhood, well, it's close to balance, right? Like it's just going to jump around. It's going to jump around a lot. By how much it's going to jump around? Well, a person joins or goes, like it's pretty flat up top of here. So, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so that explains intuition. Um, let me say a couple of words about the proof. I see that I have five minutes left. Five minutes left. So, in okay, so that's all for intuition. How do you actually prove things now? Yeah. Well, the key uh, the key tool here is what's called the Lyapunov function. It kind of bounds potential, and it allows us to bound deviations without knowing the stationary distribution. Yeah? So, the size that we want to study is this expectation. What's the expected value of an assigned item? Giving the state of the queue, but we don't know what the state of the queue is going to be. It's going to be distributed somehow, and we don't know the distribution of it. Doing transformations using the, the dual objective and a bit of algebra, we're able to decompose it to, this, uh, to those three constructs. One thing is the dual optimal. Uh, that's the optimal value. That's what we're interested in. Some loss that uh, is captured by the upper function, and that depends on the on the state, and some loss that is state independent. And the way that you can think about it is this is kind of like the continuation value. The change in potential is kind of like the continuation value that we get something that's close enough to capture. That's like well, if we're a car and we're slowing down, but we're going up, well, we kind of like take into account that it's not as bad because we're getting elevation. Uh, we, we're going to get the speed later. Okay, so in our example, maybe we allocated some items, but you know, we maybe we cleared up some space for other items, so maybe we, we're going to get it back later. Of course, the state is important, what we think. Sometimes we kind of need to capture the state direction, but like the, the upper function captures enough dependence on the state to be able to kind of bound what's left in the loss that's state independent and not too bad. So now we have this state dependent uh, value that we're trying to bound. Like the only thing that is state dependent on the right hand side is this Diabonov function. And the good thing in the budget Diabonov function is the telescopic sum. So if you think back on the curve, it's going to go uphill, downhill, uphill, downhill. The elevation will kind of cancel out in the long run. Huh? So if we take a long uh, trajectory when we walk, we're gonna like build inventory, release this inventory, go back and forth, like in the end, like whatever this lap on a function is capturing is gonna cancel out. So if we take a sum over many samples, we can cancel it out. And basically what's left is just doing some algebra and showing that this loss translate to the loss I showed you in the beginning, when you just think of this as per item and a bit, so loss per agent instead of per arrival as it's written here. Um, so that's like the key thing that allows us to do this analysis without uh, without calculating the station distribution. Um, in the last two minutes, let me just tell you a couple of other complementary results. Yeah. So first is, um, is this bound tight? Yes, it's tight. The example is actually super simple. Let me not go over it, but like it's really the simplest example that you can build. Uh, gives this tight, and it's basically where you get no feedback until there's a worse misallocation that can happen. And the opposite can happen if we set the parameters right. If we have a discrete setting, then we can actually have exponentially small loss because in this setting, we can actually generate, um, if you have a unique market clearing price and find the remaining agent types, you can actually get a lot of correcting forces before any misallocation happens. So there's gonna be some neighborhood of prices. Well, if you don't leave this neighborhood, then no bad non-misallocation can happen. And <clears throat> it's gonna be very hard to leave this neighborhood because once you deviate from the wrong prices, uh, from the market can prices, you're gonna get pushed towards them back. In. So you're gonna get exponentially small loss. So, Think about the stochastic gradient descent and how this cracks and like how the market clearing, the, the, the price adjustment dynamics kind of push you or don't push you to one market clearing prices and the properties of prices here, I think are very helpful thinking about what happens in this setting. Huh? Yeah, uh, let me uh, skip this. And if I can take just 
one more minute uh, just to tell you um, the last thing we do is we um, we ask, we get the, the sum loss here. Is this a good algorithm with a bad parameter or is this a bad algorithm? Yeah? So what we ask is let's say we have just somebody who can set monetary prices and wants to use the waiting list, like price discovery. Yeah? I don't know what the agent value distribution is. I don't know anything. I just want to maximize welfare. And I want to do this really simple, what we call stochastic gradient the same pricing heuristic. Increase price by some increment when somebody demands an item, decrease it by some increment when an item is supplied. Those are just monetary prices now. Clearly, uh, you know, uh, normal welfare calculations now apply. And we just ask, is this a sensible thing to do? What is going to be the last? If I give you an infinite Rosen, the answer is trivial. Take delta B as small as possible and you'll get small loss. Um, the more interesting problem is what if we have a finite horizon? What if a finite horizon T? Yeah. And we find that the, this really simple pricing heuristic is actually does, actually does a good job. What you want to do is you want to set the adjustment size to be inversely, uh, inversely related to the, time, to the square root of the time horizon. And basically trade off two kinds of losses. You can think of uh, those times until I converge to close to the market kind of prices, time that I really do in the learning, and the time that I already learned the, learned the prices, but I bounce around, uh, bounce around the prices. What we had before is just a bouncing around in the infinite horizon. In the long run, you're always going to bounce around. In the finite horizon, there's also going to be a learning period that's going to matter. And for the learning period, you want to take a bigger step size. You don't want to waste all your time learning the prices. Yeah? This one over square root t, one over square root time horizon trades off the other two things and get you to something that's asymptotically optimal. The loss per item is going to be as good as you can hope for in any learning, even if you do the most sophisticated algorithm. That's from a result from a Devano et al. 2018 paper that square root t, uh, one over square root t is the optimal loss here. Yeah, so the fault of this uh, of this algorithm is only in the step size. If you think of like the waiting list, as long as you're trying to maximize allocative efficiency and you're trying to get market economic prices, this is an algorithm that's going to be a very sensible algorithm, as long as you have a sensible step size. Yeah. Okay. And at this point, uh, I should probably finish. Yeah. Um, the previous one gave you price rigidity. I splashed it, but let's, let me not uh, go over too much. Um, so we think that waiting lists are interesting to study for their own sake, but also because they have a simple and natural price discovery process that's worth studying. Uh, there's a connection to stochastic gradient descent that we found to be very interesting. And we can show that like the random fluctuations from this price discovery call efficiency loss, but we can bound the loss by the adjustment size. And if you set the adjustment size correctly, you can actually do pretty well. And technically we can deal with those high dimensional multi-item uh, settings without calculating the station distribution because we use the up and functions and all those tools from uh, stochastic gradient descent literature. Well, that's it. And thank you so much. Uh, and yeah. Thanks for all the questions. Looking forward to more. Th thank you very much. Uh, excellent. So, so as our convention is, we usually start our Q and A session with uh, with our panelists. If there are any final comments or questions, uh, Francis. Yeah. Thank you, Max. Um, so, thanks a lot, uh, Jacob. I mean, it's a it's a beautiful paper, and it's uh, and you presented it extremely well. Uh, I read the paper today before, and I was a little worried actually about what I would. I mean, I you made it crystal clear, whereas the truth is that actually it's a, it's a very very technical and very complex paper. Um, I have two questions actually that I want to ask you. The first one is a little bit a question about comparative statics on delta. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that in the paper, for example, you show that when uh, in the linear case when c goes to zero or when the number of agents and the number of items goes to infinity, then delta goes to zero. Um, what I had in mind was different. I had in mind, uh, think about 
uh, changing the convexity of the cost function C. So, mm -hmm. um, and in particular, for example, what I have in mind is basically, suppose that I do not only care about the expectation of the waiting cost, but I care about the second moment or the third moment, more complicated cost functions. I'm wondering how that changes things. Uh, so let me start with that question for you. Um, so there are some technical details. So some caveat, like the, we have um, we have some technical conditions in paper, but subject to that, I think that the C that you use does not really matter that much because once you think of the expected waiting cost and you get a grid of prices, I just get a, you can just think of PJ given Q as being the primitive here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I care about is what is the grid of prices that I can generate by different configurations on the queue and how far apart are they? That will give you the delta. Okay. And my question basically about, think about uh, making C more convex and whether that, uh, how that affects delta, if you take some parameterized um, so, cost fun family of cost functions. So okay, so think of um, think of the rate of data of price points that you can generate. If C is linear, there are equal space points. Mm -hmm. If C convex, I, I'm not sure in which direction it goes, but they may not be uh, equally spaced anymore. Mm -hmm. The analysis we do is not as refined as what we could be doing because we take a bound over all possible difference between two grid points. And you may get a final bound by saying, well, well, I don't, if I can show you that prices are gonna be in some neighborhood most of the time, I don't need to worry about what is the difference in prices outside of this area. Mm -hmm. And that's what that's something we may be able to generate with more convex prices. The prices actually bunch up in a certain neighborhood, which prices are going to be more likely. And then you can generate maybe a behavior that um, prices change more dramatically, maybe at low prices, but very finely at high prices. Okay. And I think that's like well, convex. Uh, Con convex cost. Like, uh, uh, I, um, think of the grade of price points that you're yeah. traveling between. Maybe it should be more dense in some areas, more sparse in others. That's that's something you can, that's what the different Cs will do. I see, I see. The second question is more speculative. It's basically about um, uh, the fact that you, uh, that you stick to a first come, first serve queue. Um, so you could imagine that actually I I do other things. I mean, I also optimize by, uh, I don't know, I mean, so let me uh, either think about uh, not taking first come, first serve, so making the problem a bit more complicated in ways that the people behind you may actually matter. Yeah. And the second thing I had in mind is basically um, information design. I mean, how much information do you want to give about the number of people before you in the queue? If um, would that matter? For example, suppose that in the queue, suppose that you only gave that you get, only gave a signal and not the exact number of people in the queue. Um, yeah. So, have you thought along those lines? So, let me give you two separate separate answers. Okay? So, one one thing that's nice about uh, about this mechanism, this what we call the waitingness mechanism, is it doesn't need any input. You don't need to know anything. Um, you can think of mechanisms that still take no inputs, but may try to reduce the step size. Maybe I think that apartments arrive very infrequently. I want a lower step size. So uh, maybe a service in random order mechanism, like your work, my previous work, basically kind of like, you can think of this as like trying to change the step size by changing the queue dynamics. Mm -hmm. Because if I join a queue that's a random order, just like a pool of applicants that's randomly chosen, it doesn't matter. It, oh, sorry, it matters less whether there are 10 or 11 people there than in the first come first, first serve queue. So that essentially um, reduces the step size. Mm 
and by that can increase efficiency. And that stays a mechanism where I know very little about anything. I don't need to know much. Okay? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think this is very interesting. We don't do that exactly because you said like that requires analysis that includes beliefs. Yeah, so I'll, uh, we made life simple to ourselves. Uh, we try to kind of uh, push on the price discovery and we had to deal with some things that were complicated for us. So we simplified in other dimension, but I completely agree. This is like exactly the, the, the first order kind of like uh, Think to kind of like to think about if you think about design of different mechanisms here. Oh, one of the things that I would, would think about. Uh, the second thing that you asked, uh, information design, I would put in a very separate bucket. It's a very interesting question too, but that's not a setting where you say the the mechanism does not know anything. That would be a setting where you kind of uh, where the planner knows some things and wants to put them into the mechanism. Mm -hmm. For example, you can think of a planner that knows that the Brooklyn apartment should be two years, two years, uh, two years wait, and says, I have a queue that's fluctuating. How do I make it such that uh, the choices of the agent will be as if they saw the two year wait? Maybe I can do some information design or other things, other perspectives to kind of stabilize the waiting time in the queue, given that I know it should be two, two years. I think this is a very interesting uh, problem too, but I, I see it as distinct from what we we kind of think of it as here. I think of uh, you can have the queue do price discovery if you don't know anything, and if you do know things and you're taking an information design perspective, then you have to fight its price discovery and kind of annihilate it in a way. Uh, and that's what I see information design as potentially able to do in this setting. And also a very interesting problem, but separate from, I see it separate from. No, no, I agree, I agree. I'm just thinking that actually there is, I'm uh, on the practical side, uh, there are actually issues about that. And people are asking themselves questions, for example, the, fa the famous uh, housing, uh, social housing authorities in Paris wonder how much information they should be giving yeah. about how many people are ahead of you in the queue. And so on, and that's uh, so. But I agree, it's separate from the price discovery um, question that you're asking in that paper. Yeah. Thanks. Then, uh, are there any other questions? We still have a couple of minutes before the the end of the official part. I I have maybe a question, uh, but if there are other people, okay. So let me ask. Um, Actually, before before doing that, we are actually close to quarter past. So let me officially thank you for for the for the talk. Uh, I'm going to stop the the live streaming right now. Thank thank you, Francis, for coming as.